Hello, my dear students. Welcome to Teacher at Home. Today, class, we are going to learn the tenth chapter, India after independence. A new and divided nation. When India became independent in August 1947, it faced a series of very great challenges. As a result of partition, eight million refugees had come into the country from what was now Pakistan. These people have to be found homes and jobs. Then there was the problem of the princely states, almost 500 of them, each ruled by Maharaja or a Nawab, each of whom had to be persuaded to join the new nation. The problems of the refugees and to the princely states had to be addressed immediately. In the longer term, the new nation had to adopt a political system that would best serve the hopes and expectations of the population. Less than six months after independence, the nation was in mourning. On 30th January 1948, Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated by a fanatic Nathuram Khodse because he disagreed with Gandhi's conversion that Hindus and Muslims should live together in harmony. That evening, a standard nation heard Jawaharlal Nehru's moving statement over all India radio, friends and comrades, the light has gone. out of our lives and there is darkness everywhere our beloved leader the father of the nation is no more india's population in 1947 was large almost 345 million it was also divided there were divisions between high caste and low caste between the majority hindu community and indians who practiced other faith the citizens of this vast land spoke many different languages wore many different kinds of dress ate different kinds of food and practiced different professions how could they be made to live together in one nation state to the problem of unity was added the problem of development at independence the vast majority of indians lived in the village farmers and peasants depended on the monsoon for their survival so did the non farm sector of the rural economy for if the crops failed Barbers, carpenters, weavers, and other service groups would not get paid for the service either. In cities, factory workers lived in crowded slums with little access to education or healthcare. Clearly, the new nation had to lift its masses out of poverty by increasing the productivity of agriculture and by promoting new job-creating industries. Unity and development had to go hand in hand. the divisions between different sections of india were not healed they could result in violent and costly conflicts high caste fighting with low caste hindus and muslims and with muslims and so on at the same time if the fruits of economic development did not reach the broad masses of the population it could create fresh divisions for example between the rich and the poor between cities of the and the country side between regions of india that were prosperous and regions that lagged behind a constitution is written between december 1946 and november 1949 sub 300 indians had a series of meetings on the country's political future meetings of this constituent assembly were held in new delhi but the participants came from all over india and from different political parties this discussions resulted in the framing of the indian constitution which came into effect on 26 january 1950 one feature of the constitution was its adoption of universal adult franchise all indian above the age of 21 would be allowed to vote in state and national elections this was revolutionary step for never before had indians been allowed to choose their own leaders in other countries such as the united kingdom and the united states the right had been granted in stages first only men of property had the vote the men who were educated are also added on working class men got the vote only after a long struggle finally after a bitter struggle of their own american and british women were granted the vote on the other hand soon after independence india chose to grant this right to all its citizens regardless of gender class or education A second feature of the constitution was that it guaranteed equality before the law to all citizens 
regardless of their caste or religious affiliation. There were some Indians who wished that the political system of the new nation be based on Hindu ideals and that he, India itself be run as a Hindu state. They pointed to the example of Pakistan, a country created explicitly to protect and further the interest of a particular religious community, the Muslims. However, the Indian Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru was one of the opinion was of the opinion that India could not and must not become a Hindu Pakistan. Besides Muslims, India also had large populations of Sikhs and Christians as well as many Parsis and Jains. Under the new constitution, they would have the same right as Hindus. The same opportunity when it came to seeking jobs in government or the private sector, the same rights before the law. A third feature of the constitution was that it offered special privileges for the poorest and most disadvantaged Indians. The practice of untouchability described as a slur and a blot on their fair name of India was abolished. Hindu temples previously open to only the higher caste were thrown open to all, including the former untouchables. After a long debate, the Constituent Assembly also recommended that a certain percentage of seats in legislatures as well as jobs in government be reserved for members of the lower caste. It had been argued by some of the untouchable or as they were not known, Harijan, candidates did not have enough, good enough grade to get into the prestigious Indian Administrative Service. But as one member of the Constituent Assembly, H.J. Kadekar, argued it was the upper caste who were responsible for the Harijans being unfit today. Addressing his most privileged colleges, Kadekar said, We were sup suppressed for thousands of years. You engage us in your service, that is colleagues, sir, to serve your own ends and suppress us to such an extent that neither our minds nor our bodies, not even our hearts work, nor are we able to march forward. Along with the former untouchables, the Nadiwasi or scheduled tribes were also granted reservation in seats and jobs. Like the scheduled castes, the Indians too had been deprived and discriminated against. The tribals had been deprived of modern health care and education, while their lands and forests had been taken away by more powerful outsiders. The new privileges granted them by the constitution were made to make amends for this. The Constituent Assembly spent many days discussing the power of the central government versus those of the state government. Some members thought that the sender's interest should be foremost. Only a strong sender, it was argued, would be in the position to think and plan for the well-being of a country as a whole. Other members felt that the provinces should have great autonomy and freedom. A member from ISO feared that under the present system, democracy is centered in Delhi and is not allowed to work in the same sense and spirit in the rest of the country. A member from the Madras insisted that we must give them security and rights. Nehru wrote in a letter to the Chief Minister of State, we have a Muslim minority who are so large in numbers that they cannot even if they want go anywhere else. That is a basic fact about there can be no argument whatever the provocation from Pakistan and whatever indignities and horrors inflicted on non-Muslim there we have got to deal with this minority in a civilized manner we must give them security and the right to citizen in a democratic state insisted that the initial responsibility for the well-being of the people of the provinces should rest with the provi provincial governments. The constitution sought to balance these competing claims by providing three lists of subjects as a union list with subjects such as taxes, defense and foreign affairs, which would be the exclusive responsibility of the center. A state list of subjects such as education and health, which would be taken care of principally by the states, a concurrent list under which would come subjects such as forest and agriculture, in which the center and the state 
would have joint responsibility. Another major debate in the Constituent Assembly concerned language. Many members believed that the English language should leave India with the British rulers. It place they argued should be taken by Hindi. However, those who did not speak Hindi were of a different opinion. Speaking in the assembly, T. T. Krishnamajari conveyed a warning on behalf of people of the South, some of whom threatened to separate from India if Hindi was imposed on them. A comp com compromise was finally arrived at, namely that while Hindi would be the official language of India, English would be used in the courts, the services and communications between one state and another. Many Indian contributed to the framing of the constitution, but perhaps the most important role was played by Dr. P. R. Ambedkar, who was the chairman of the drafting committee and under whose supervision the document was finalized. In his final speech to the Constituent Assembly, Dr. Ambedkar pointed out the political democracy had to be accompanied by economic and social democracy. Giving the right to vote would not automatically lead to the removal of other inequalities such as between rich and poor or between upper and lower caste. With the new constitution, he said, India was going to enter into a life of contradictions. In politics, we will have equality and social and economic life which will have inequality. In politics, we will be recognizing the principle of one man, one vote, one value. In our social and economic life, we shall, by reason of our social and economic structure, continue to deny the principle of one man and one value. How were states to be formed? Back in the 1920s, the Indian National Congress, main party of the freedom struggle, had promised that once the country won independence, each major linguistic group would have its own province. However, after independence, the Congress did not take any steps to honor this promise, for India had been divided on the basis of religion. Despite the wishes and efforts of Mahatma Gandhi, freedom had come not to one nation but to two. As a result of the partition of India, more than a million people had been killed in riots between Hindus and Muslims. Could the country afford further divisions on the basis of language? Both Prime Minister Nehru and Deputy Prime Minister Vallabhai Patel were against the recreation of creation of linguistic states. After the partition, Nehru said, disruptionist tendencies had come to the force. To check them, the nation had to be strong and united. Or as Patel, but if the first and last need of India at the present moment is that it should be made a nation. Everything which helps the growth of nationalism has to go forward and everything which throws obstacles in its way has to be rejected. We have applied this test to linguistic provinces also and by the test, in our opinion, cannot be supported that the Congress leaders would now go back to their promise created just great disappointment. The Canada speakers Malayalam speakers, Marathi speakers have all looked forward to having their own state. The strongest protect, however, came from the Telugu speaking district of what was the present presidency, Madras presidency. When Nehru went to campaign there during the general elections of 1952, he was met with a black flags and slogan demanding we want Audra. In October of that year, a veteran Gandhian named Poti Sri Ramalu went on a hunger strike demanding the formation of Andhra state to protect the interest of Telugu speakers. As the past went on, it attracted much support. Hartals and burns was observed in many towns. On 15 December 1952, 58 days of his past, Poti Sri Ramalu died. As a newspaper put it, the news of the passing away of Sri Ramalu engulfed entire Andhra in Chaos. The protests were so widespread and intense that the central government was forced to give in to the demand. Thus, on 1st October 1953, the new state of Andhra came into being, which subsequently became Andhra Pradesh. After the creation of Andhra, other linguistic communities also demanded their own separate states. A state reorganization commission was set up, which submitted its report in 1956. 
recommending the redrawing of district and provincial boundaries to form compact provinces of Assamese, Bengali, Odia, Tamil, Malayalam, Kannada and Telugu speakers respectively. The large Hindi speaking region of North India was also to be broken up into several states. A little later, in 1960, the bilingual state of Bombay was divided into separate states for Marathi and Gujarati speakers. In 1966, the state of Punjab was also divided into Punjab and Haryana, the former for the Punjabi speakers who were also mostly Sikhs, the latter to the rest, who spoke not Punjabi but versions of Haranvi or Hindi. A state ceased to be princely state as and when its prince agreed to merger with India or Pakistan or was defeated. But many of the states were retained as administrative units until 31st October 1956 and the category and as while princely state for the period of 1947-48, 31st October 1956. Planning for development. Lifting India and Indians out of poverty and building a modern technical and industrial base were among the major objectives of a new nation. In 1950, the government set up a planning commission to help design and execute suitable policies for economic development. There was a broad agreement on what was called on mixed economy model. Here both the state and the private sector would play important and complementary roles in increasing production and generating jobs. What specially? These roles were to be what industries should be initiated by the state and which by the market, how to achieve a balance between the different regions and state was to be defined by the planning commission. In 1956, the second five-year plan was formulated. This focused strongly on the development of heavy industries such as steel and on the building of large dams. The sectors would be under the control of the state. This focus on heavy industries and the effort at state regulation of the economy was to guide economic policy for the next few decades. This approach had many strong supporters but also some vocal critics. Nehru on the five-year plans. Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru was a great supporter of the planning process. He explained the ideals and purpose of planning in a series of letters he wrote to the chief ministers of the different state. In a letter of 22, December 1952, he said that behind the first five-year plan lies the conceptions of India's unity and of the mighty cooperative effect of all the peoples of India. We have to remember always that it is not merely the governmental machinery that counts in all this, but even more so the enthusiasm and cooperation of the people. Our people must have the sensation of partnership in a mighty enterprise of being fellow travelers towards the next goal that they and we have said before us. The plan may be and has to be based on the calculation and economics, statisticians and the like, but figures and statistics, very important as they are, do not give life to the scheme. That breadth of life comes in other ways and it is for us now to make the plan, which is enshrined in cold print, something living, vital and dynamic, it captures the imagination of the people. Some felt that it had put inadequate emphasis on agriculture. Others argued that it had neglected primary education. Still others believed that it had not taken into account the environmental implications of economic policies. As Mahatma Gandhi's follower, Mirab Band, wrote in 1949 by science and missionary, Ki mankind may get huge returns for a time but ultimately will come dissolution. We have got to study nature's balance and develop our lives within her laws if we are to survive as a physically health and morally decent species. Since the Belize steel plant was set up with the help of the former Soviet Union 1959, located in the backward rural area of Chhattisgarh. It came to be seen as an important sign of the development of modern India after independence. Search for independent foreign policy. India gained freedom soon after the devastations of the Second World War. At that time, a new international body, the United Nations formed in 1945, was its infancy. In 1950s and 1960s, saw the emergence of the Cold War, that is power 
rivalries and ideological conflicts between the USA and the USSR, with both countries creating military alliances. This was also the period when colonial empires were collapsing and many countries were attaining independence. Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, who was also the foreign minister of newly independent India, developed Free India's foreign policy discontents. Now, Nalagman formed the bedrock of this foreign policy. Led by the statesmen from England, Yugoslavia, Indonesia, Ghana, and India, the non aligned movement urged countries not to either of these two major alliances. But this policy of staying away from alliance was not a matter of remaining isolated or neutral. The former means remaining aloof from world affairs, whereas non aligned countries such as India played an active role in mediating between the American and the Soviet alliance. They tried to prevent war, often taking a humanitarian and moral stand against war. How, for one reason or another, many non-aligned countries, including India, got involved in wars. By the 1970s, a large number of countries have joined the non-aligned movement. The nation 60 years ago, on, on 15th August 2007, India celebrated 60 years of its independent existence as a free nation. How well has the country done in that time? And to that, what extent has it fulfilled the ideals set out in the constitution? That India is still united and that it is still democratic are achievements that we might justly be proud of. Many foreign observers have felt that India could not survive as a single country, that it would break up into many parts, with each region of linguistic group seeking to form a nation of its own. Others believed that it would come under military rule. However, as many as 13 general elections have been held since independence, as well as hundreds of state and local elections, there is a free press, as well as the independent judiciary. Finally, the fact that people speak different languages or practice different faith has not come in the way of national unity. On the other hand, deep divisions persist. Despite constitutional guarantees, untouchables or as they are now referred to as the Dalit face violence and discrimination. In many parts of rural India, they are not allowed access to water sources, temples, parks and other public places. And despite the secular ideals enshrined in the constitution, there have been clashes between regional, different regions, groups in many states. Above all, as many observers have noted, the gulf between the rich and the poor has grown over the years. Some parts of India and some groups of Indians have benefited a great deal from economic development. They live in large houses and dine in expensive restaurants, send their children to expensive private schools and take expensive foreign holidays. At the same time, many others continue to live below the poverty line, used in houses used in urban slums or living in remote villages on lands that is little, they cannot afford to send their school children to school. The constitution recognizes equality before the law, but in real life, some Indians are more equal than others. Judged by the standard itself, set itself at its independence, the Republic of India had not been a great success, but it's not been a failure either. Elsewhere, what happened in Sri Lanka? 1956, the year the state of India was reorganized on the basis of language, the parliament of Sri Lanka, then Ceylon, introduced an act recognizing Sinhala as the sole official language of the country. This made Sinhala the medium of instruction in all states, schools and colleges, public examination and in the court. The new act was opposed by the Tamil-speaking minority who lived in the north of the island. When you deny me my language, said one Tamil MP, you deny me everything. You are hoping for a divided Ceylon, one another. Adding, do not fear, I assure that uh, we'll have a divided Ceylon. An opposition member himself, Sinhala speaking, predicted that if the government did not change its mind and insisted on the act being passed, two torn little bleeding states might yet arise out of one little state. For several decades now, a civil war has ragged in Sri Lanka, whose root lie in the imposition of the Sinhala language on the Tamil-speaking minority. And another an, um, South Asian country, Pakistan, was divided into two, 
when the bengali speakers of the east felt that the language was being suppressed by contrast india has managed to survive as a single nation in part because their many regional languages were given freedom to flourish had hindi been imposed on south india in the way that urdu was imposed on east pakistan or singhala or northern sri lanka india too might have been civil war and fragmentation contrary to the fears of jahangir nehru and sada patel linguistic states had not the threatened the unity of india rather they had deepened this unity one the fear of one's language being suppressed has gone the different linguistic group have been come and to live as part of the larger nation called india so that's all about this chapter if you are interested please do like share and subscribe my channel okay thank you